Good evening, everyone. My name is Gilbert, and on behalf of Roman's Bookstore, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event with uh, Margaret Stoll and Melissa De La Cruz in conversation with Hera Mafi discussing Joe and Laurie. We are so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this uncertain time. Now, uh, Romans Live will continue to host virtual events, and you can learn more about them on our website as well as our social media. Our next event is tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, June 10th at 6 p.m. with uh, Jessica Kim, Pablo Cartaya, and Lilium Rivera presenting their latest releases. For regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media. Now, this evening's virtual event will have a Q&A component. So to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button, uh, which is right over here. Uh, if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our authors to answer, please click the Like button. We will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Now, also, if you'd like to purchase a copy of tonight's featured book, as well as our interviewer's book, you can click on the green uh, purchase button or buy button uh, directly below the viewer screen right here. It says buy Joe and Laurie, uh, and it will take you to our Romans Bookstore website and the event page where you can see uh, or you can purchase Joe and Laurie um, as well as Tahira's book. Now, on to our uh, authors for this evening. Tahira Mafi is the New York Times bestselling and National Book Award nominated author of books for children and young adults. She currently resides in Southern California with her husband, fellow author Ransom Riggs, and their daughter. The final book in the Shatter Me series, Imagine Me, uh, is now on shelves. And like I said, you can uh, find it on the event page. Margaret Stoll is a number one New York Times bestselling nerd, world builder, and video game creator, comic book writer, and festival founder. As an award-winning young adult author, she has been published in 50 countries and 32 languages and has sold more than 10 million books worldwide. Uh, her novel, Beautiful Creatures, was released as a feature film for Warner Brothers and Alcon Entertainment. When not roaming the halls of Seattle game developer Bungie, where she oversees the creation of new global IPs, Margaret can often be seen at Comic-Con when they happen, I guess, or at one of the teen and youth book festivals that she co-founded, uh, Y'all Fest in Charleston, South Carolina, and Y'all West in Santa Monica, the largest in the country. Melissa De La Cruz is the number one New York Times, number one Publishers Weekly, and number one indie-bound best-selling author of many critically acclaimed and award-winning book novels for readers of all ages, including the Blue Blood series, The Isle of the Lost, and Something in Between. Her more than 30 books have also topped the USA Today, Wall Street Journal, and Los Angeles Times bestseller lists and have been published in over 20 countries. A former fashion and beauty editor, Melissa has also written for the New York Times, Marie Claire, Harper's Bazaar, Glamour, Cosmopolitan, Allure, The San Francisco Chronicle, McSweeney's, Teen Vogue, Cosmo Girl, and Seventeen. That covers most of our newsstand. Uh, <laughs> Melissa lives in West Hollywood, California with her husband and daughter. And that being said, I'd like to welcome all of our authors and thank you for being here tonight. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much, Gilbert. The stage is yours. <laughs> Yay. Okay, I don't think I've ever heard your bios like read in full like that. So first of all, <laughs> I feel like that should be the first conversation we have. Um, or maybe not even a conversation, just a statement. Wow. Wow. Uh, I'm honored to be in your presence, not just because you're at these like two amazing powerhouses, but because you're also some of the most amazing women I know. Um, because they're buddies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's really a, a pleasure um, for those of you who are watching now. Like we spent like the last ten minutes just talking because we just miss each other so much, and it's a delight to see your wonderful faces, um, and an even greater delight now to talk to you about this amazing book. I mean, can we? Can I just? First of all, I feel like you guys should 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 do the summary. We should talk about what inspired this. You know, talk a little bit about it. But like, I think I just. I hope I'm speaking for everybody when I say, you wrote the book that we all wanted. It's the book that I wanted. <laughs> I just want to say, I think you were the very last person I saw, Baba, before, uh, before we shut the world down. So it's so, so fun to see your face again. But I think you were my last lunch outside, outside <laughs> jail, outside of jail. So it's really, really fun to see you. Thank you for doing this also. Thank you guys. 
That's my I really thank you, Margie. I remember this lunch because I was like, oh, and now you're going to go see Tara. Say hi. <laughs> and I remember that. That was it. <laughs> before. before we shut it down. down. Yeah. I know. I've seen her since the, before I've seen you, Mel. Because I, I think know. Right? <laughs> yeah. right after that. I'm honored. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're describing the book. Uh, okay. So uh, the book came from an idea that I had had. Um, I wanted to do a little women retelling, but I didn't know how to do it. And I'd written a couple of drafts, not drafts, like proposals uh, for my agent to look at. So one was like a Downton Abbey kind of style retelling. This is like oh, what we do that too, write that yeah, too. Right? <laughs> That wasn't too bad. And then there was one that kind of um, uh, put Amy in the middle. You know, it was called Amy and Her Sisters. Um, and then there was one that was a modern retelling that was more middle grade y. And I don't know, none of them really um, kind of was right. And then I was telling Margie about, you know, kind of the latest Little Women retelling failure. And she said, oh my God, I'm, you know, a scholar of Victorian literature. I know everything about, you know. I'm pretty sure I didn't say scholar, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a scholar. I'm a scholar. <laughs> ah. Yeah, she's a scholar. <laughs> um, and Margie said, what is it about the book that we love? And what is it about the book that we would change if we could? You know, he was, she was kind of like, you know, why do you want to retell it? And then I think it was you who said, it, isn't it all about Lori, that she didn't end up with Lori? And I said, you were a genius. That is the book, Joe and Lori. <laughs> it's the twist. It's the ending that like, OK, so I feel like I should make it clear because we've talked about this. And like I actually I had the same misconception um, from years and years ago and was reminded when I saw the movie recently, actually, recently, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, Joe does not end up alone. So like no. that the retelling or that the story is like, oh, she she just is like, I don't want to get married, and she says no to all men. But she doesn't. She marries the professor. Yeah, right? I mean that, that was really for me anyway. What would, I mean, my attraction to working on the book was that, uh, and Mel and I agreed on this. It was like the book we. The first book we had that showed us what it was like to be a woman and a writer, a girl and a writer. So like there, there were all kinds of things going on even beside the romance. Right. But for sure with the romance, looking back at it as a writer, what it really is is a genre betrayal, right? Like she said, because Little Women, some people don't know, has published its two books. And so the first book, you know, Little Woman hits the stands, it immediately sells 2,000 copies and she's an instant <laughs> bestseller and rich very shortly after, which, you know, she only had because they gave her a royalty because no one thought it would make any money, so they wouldn't care in advance. And then suddenly she has to write the sequel, and we have all been there, right? So that was right. a part of the attraction. But, um, but dealing with that, like, the pivot from what she wrote when she was really writing genre fiction, like a romance with, like, the perfect boy next door, and then the pivot to, I'm a big star and I can write, you know, I, I got to write something important because my father is a famous transcendentalist and I'm friends with Thoreau or whatever. Like that pivot was what made me so mad the whole time. Was yeah. that it wasn't true to the arc she set up. Yeah. At the end of the first Little Women book, so it's Little Women and Good Wives. Yeah. Um, you know, it ends with Lori saying, I'll be there for you, Joe, all the days of your life. I'm, you know, he has his hand on her. Yeah, and you're like, oh, you know. <laughs> and then in Good Wives, she turns him down. And yeah. that's the saddest moment of our childhood, you know. <laughs> I remember being 11 and being like, what? She's going to change her mind. Yeah, yeah, come on, you know. Yeah. And then, you know, she goes off and meets some old guy. Yes. Right? Oh, she no, worse than that. An old German philosopher who shaved her for writing Rodrigo and Rodin. And yes. not write genre fiction. Yes. Domesticates her into writing like more important stuff. I just, that drove me crazy. Yeah. Aside from the fact that it's the greatest, you know, I love that book more than anything. Right. Was my, that was my love hate fave. So you fixed it. 
you fake you fake it. it. Well, I really love Little Women so much. I think that you know it comes from. It's a tribute. It's an affectionate story. Um, you know, I don't. I don't know. It's it's really the respect. Respect. Yeah, we wanted to write what you know we wanted to read, I guess, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think that was really fun was to go back into that world. Um, which, you know, Margie really captured because we uh, split up our, um, you know, kind of like what we were in charge of, you know, and I'm an outliner. And Margie said, it's all about tone. <laughs> and that's to be fair, I said, tone is all we have, Mel. Tone, it's all we have. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so curious about this though. Tell me more about the process. Tell me more about what it was like working together on this, you know, like, what was that, um, how, how was it? And Margie, you have experienced doing this. Mel, have you written books with others before? Mm -hmm. With your husband? With, uh, no, I wrote um, three novels with my husband. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because before we embarked on this project, um, I think, you know, some of our friends were warning us, actually, Margie's husband warned us and said, do you re really want to write a book together? What if your friendship suffers? And after I had written all these books with Mike, I was like, I'm never writing a book with this again. <laughs> like, we have to go to therapy. Um, and so, like, I was so naive. Like, oh, I'll be fine. I'll write a book with my best friend. What could be wrong? You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I would say 99% of the time it was great. And oh. then we fought. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about that one person. I like to think we fought like sisters, which was in keeping with the book about sisters. I mean, yeah. and uh, and we really we have a lot of respect for each other's brains, and we have really different brains. That's part of it. But that's um, what makes it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Really, like it's a good match because um, because I'm nowhere like she. Mel is a like a propulsive masterpiece like she can she can figure out she's pulling levers the whole time right and you leave me on my own and i'll just start to write a hundred pages about someone's inner sorrow right like that's like, <laughs> so like i mean we definitely had this yin and yang going and um, and for me the most important thing the the thing about the tone is if we couldn't get the voice of a 19th century contemporary didn't want to do it. Right. And that's, so I spent eight years studying American literature, like literally 19th century. A scholar. <laughs> wow. I'm a scholar, okay? No, but I went to yeah. Amherst College. We had Emily Dickinson's house on campus and I wow. studied her compulsively. I mean, I, I basically, I just kind of moved into the 19th century and then I was at Stanford and Yale doing the same thing. And, you know, that was like eight years of it. So that's a specific sentence construction and it's like a specific mindset and the words aren't the same. And so I didn't know if we could actually like pull off the voice. So that was what I was. Yeah. So <laughs> wow. But you, I mean, but it's flawless. It's amazing. I mean, I don't even know. I honestly, I have no idea how you pulled that off. I'm always, I'm like, I'm amazed. I mean, not amazed, but obviously you're a scholar and a genius. Both of you are these like incredible, incredible wonder women. No, really though. I mean, it's so tough. I love historical novels, like just across the board, but like, I don't think, I don't know, life is long. We'll see one day. Maybe if I also can, you know, study under the tutelage of Margaret Stoll, yes. one day be. One day be good enough, but but I just I find it so intimidating getting that voice right, you know, getting the tone right, getting that yeah. language just right is so tricky. And when you develop an ear, I mean, you have to work on your ear. Yeah. And when you do for writing. Wow. Yeah. And then, like, but, the, but the best thing is, is when the reader reads it and doesn't even notice. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's just seamless. Like that's how you know that it's just. There are no anachronistic like moments. It's like, it really feels true. It feels authentic. Oh, so that's oh thank you. I just I'm, I'm really, the that glory. <laughs> no, really, I, I'm so, I'm truly impressed. I loved it. I really, I also like, I have to say, like I find this conversation kind of cathartic in general because we're talking about things like, like we literally a moment ago just talked about something that I had been feeling about Little Women for so long, which was that, 
the original ending felt like kind of a betrayal. Yeah. It felt like I was being shamed for wanting that happily right. after. Exactly. Right? Right. And I'm like, <laughs> right now. She didn't marry anybody. She married this like professor who was like rude to her and insulting. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like, well, yeah, Greta Gerwig in her adaptation implies this year basically almost implies that he's fictional, right? Yeah. And, and in our version, they're in the garden sitting there like trying to, the sisters are trying to help Joe with her plot problems, which is all too real. And I have a big garden where I work out the plot problems, but um, but there is a cabbage, and they get to his name because he's a boar. Like he, he doesn't do anything in that in that storyline. He's just the the absence of someone who's like rooting for you and letting you write Rodrigo and Rodan. Yeah. Mel is a believer in like Joe needs to be able to have it all. Oh yeah, like yeah. that was her like mission. Definitely. I mean, because then I think as a kid, I was like, wait, I mean, we love Lori because he loved Joe, who in her um, own description is plain and, you know, just writes all the time and like has frizzy, you know what I mean? Like she's not the beauty, like Meg is the beauty. She's not, you know, like the other one with the perfect manners, like Amy. You know, she's more of the, you know, kind of gawky girl that, you know, when you're 11, we're all gawky girls. And he loves her. And, you know, to... For like he her, loves her. Yeah. Right? You know? He loves her. He loves her. He loves her. He loves her. And she turned him down. Why? <laughs> you know, we could just talk about yeah. that. I really think it wouldn't have broken my heart if she'd actually just ended up with no one. Yeah, if no. I would have broken my heart. Yeah, I would have out with that. I would have even considered that as like a viable option for yeah. us writers. I mean, this was my playbook. I told people I, I was going to go write in a garret in Sardinia overlooking the Azure Sea. Like that was my plan. Like I, it's a good blueprint. It's still a good plan. Wait, so do you guys want to talk? A little bit about how, because um, we have a couple more minutes before we take questions. Do you want to talk a little bit about how Louisa May Alcott was actually like your your real inspiration for this particular Joe character? Because she was the one who remained unmarried, not Joe, not the original Joe March. Exactly. Yeah. No. I think um, I think people do kind of, uh, and the Greta Gerwig movie definitely kind of conflated that. You know, because she was also uh, kind of inspired by Louisa's letters and her real biography. So Lori was based on these two uh, men who were, you know, kind of her sweethearts, right, Margie? When she uh, was in plays with, she was in plays all the time in in um, Massachusetts, and one who she traveled in Europe with. So she had, I mean, she loved, she yeah, had lovers. Love, but, you know, she did avowedly, like, Louisa had no plans to marry, but partly she'd also, uh, her parents had, you know, like a difficult marriage, which I really loved reading about because it, it explains so much about the book where they're just sort of like, she sends her father off to the Civil War. <laughs> you deal with that yeah. and mom's here, you know, they're yeah. really not easy. So I, I found all the, I found how, like, and Greta Gerwig says this too, I found how modern it was really fascinating. Like, when you look at it, the shadow of Beth, you know, there was a lot of death in Louise's life and in the time. And like, Beth, this is why we actually, in our book, this is a spoiler, death has, Beth has already died. And like the shadow of that explains so much. But like, my parents aren't both there. My sister has died. You know, like I'm incredibly worried about money and trying to figure that all out. And then like to make money, which is like the most significant issue in Louisa Malcott's real life period to the extent that she goes to um to mill dam and stands at the edge of it and contemplates jumping it's in her letters you know like and it's literally about like the trials of trying to support yourself because the father never has any money yeah like, so, so like on top on top of of just like of all of that it's it seemed like um I have no idea where he's going with this, but it seems like, riveted. <laughs> incredibly important. Oh, anyway, it was really it was a modern story. Yes, and we wanted to be able to really explore 
like having the, your way out of that was this is what it was that your way out of that was having to write about your sisters and marry them off yeah. in the story because that's what she did yeah it's like it's like has to give them the literally the marriage plot and like give them all those endings so like we wanted to focus on that process and how hard it would be because you know we've all been there right like how hard that is especially in the middle of your family to try to write about your family in a way that's going to make you the money to get you out of debt it's crazy right. and without alienating them yeah <laughs> <laughs> We haven't even, we haven't even, okay, so we, I'm looking at the time now. We haven't even talked about the fact that, like, obviously you guys can relate so much to the struggle of, like, how do you write the bestseller? How do you write the sequel to the bestseller? Um, so if we have some time, I'm going to look at the questions now. So just a uh, general note to the, to anybody watching now, we're going to start taking questions from the audience. We've got about 20 minutes to do this. So we're going to try and do it in as um, efficient and succinct a manner as possible. So if you have questions, you can just send them in. Um, at the bottom of the screen, there's a little link, hyperlink. You can click on it. Says "Ask a Question," I believe. Um, uh, so, but if we if we don't get a lot of questions, I'm going to ask you some follow-ups. Um, I love this conversation. Okay, so a couple of questions from the audience. Um, how, oh, here's a question: How old were you when you first read Little Women? I love that question. I think you kind of answered it, but just to clarify, because it's such a, you know. Okay, so I think I was 11. My mom would go every week to an independent bookstore in LA called Campbell Tolstad. And there was a woman there who would save, put books aside for me. Like that, because my mother said, my child's a reader, what do I do? And, and, and really my whole career comes from that. I mean, truly. Really. And so one of them was this at age 11 he said wow. your, special, your special reader needs to read this and i read this and i just ate it up and it was about writing and I was wow. yeah no i was 11. i i really remember it because i was 11 and my mom i don't know if you guys remember it but they were like they were these illustrated classic books and they were from the 60s and they were like mm -hmm. really thick and it's not this one this is the one margie gave me when we sold the book. That was the one I had. Yeah, this is the one from our, yeah, I don't have the one from my mom because we moved from the Philippines and um, and they didn't send over my book. So yeah, oh. <laughs> anyway, oh I, uh, didn't quite make it on the boat um, oh on the river here. But, uh, but it was Little Women and it was Sweet Valley High. And so <laughs> oh. that I loved when I was 11, yeah. which is so funny, right? Because Little Women is so you know, it's like a story that also has morals that really kind of taught you. I mean, I remember reading about, you know, how they dealt with the siblings and how they dealt with marriage and good wives and really thinking like, oh, that's the way to live. You shouldn't talk about, you know, anybody outside your, about your family, to people outside your family, you know? Well, <laughs> I, mean, I only took the writer lessons, which is like, <laughs> um, you can make your own newspaper. You can talk with your friends about writing. You, Rodrigo and Rebecca, you can put on plays in your living room. Like, I basically took fandom away from Little Women. Yeah. <laughs> that, actually, um, that part of, that's also fascinating to see, like, how you stripped it apart, how you stripped it for parts, really. Yeah. And how you it, those parts to it is, the book uh, takes place, I don't know if we made that clear, but it takes place, it, first of all, it imagines that Joe wrote Little Women. And then, so she's written Little Women, it's been published, and now she's writing the sequel, which is Good Lives. So, and that's where our book kind of veers off. So Little Women, the first book, is still real. <laughs> and then, you know, yeah. then our book takes over. <laughs> okay, so somebody has asked um, who your favorite Lori is from all of the various film adaptations. I love that. <laughs> it's a more indulgent question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think mine is Timothy because it's the latest one, and yeah. I don't think I saw. I really don't remember watching the one with Winona, which is so yeah. weird. Isn't that odd? I don't. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't do that one. The one with uh, Christian Bale. You know, Christian Bale is the ultimate Lord. <laughs> Justin <laughs> is Lori perfection, but I really do think the best Joe is Catherine Hepburn. I mean, this movie has been done so many times. The BBC just did a great version also uh, that had Maya Hawke, right? Uma Thurman's daughter. 
Yeah. I, I have not seen it. You have seen everything. Barney has seen yeah. every Little Women iteration in Hollywood. I, I have yeah. seen every Little Women available, including the anime. And that was a stretch. Yeah. I didn't even know the anime Little Women. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, some of the fights become sort of cultural touchstones. Like, we talked about this before, but I was watching. Um, my brilliant friend, the Elena Grande adapt adaptation, and there are these two girls in Naples, like pouring over their cop, like with no money, pouring over their copy of Little Women, and you know, speculating on that. And I, and I just thought, this is one of those. I mean, there are some books like that, you know. It's, it's the Bible for right. women writers, right? Mm -hmm. so, like, who well, um, modeled writing as a viable career for you? Mm -hmm. Oh. Who modeled writing? I mean, that's a long. That my answer is I didn't. I didn't even think I could be a writer until after I graduated from college. So I didn't. That had never occurred to me. Um, I never thought it was a viable profession for me. Uh, so that's a different. We won't go off on that tangent. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Next lunch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about it. Um, somebody else actually wants to know. Um, and I think this is very interesting. Uh, what you think Joe and Lori's tragic flaws are, like individually? Oh, this is like this is like English lit. <laughs> the AP test. I mean, if you don't know, so I think Lori is wrecked by the death of his mother, who's Italian opera singer. I think that so I think he has this like trauma about being a dilettante and not taking himself seriously. So he's afraid. I think he admires Joe because she's able to be really serious about what she loves and like openly really passionate. And he is he is he has the means to not have to support himself that way, but also I think there are other sort of cultural expectations for him. But I think his his defining um, conflict, I don't know if it's a flaw, but his his like formative um, propulsive problem comes, I believe, from his mother dying as a character. Um, and I think with Joe, I think for her it's about power. Mm. And I think she would tell you that it was about her being stubborn or messing everything up, but I actually think it's about power. And I think, I think part of her issue with men is just sort of conceding that and, and not, you know, I, and I think she has a hard time being loved. That's where we got to in the book. Like, it's a line, it's one of my like favorite sort of places we got in the book that why does, why does, why does being loved feel like such an effort for her? Wow. Like how fraught that is. But I think, I think yeah. that's her. But also when Lori goes off to Harvard, you know, and is just like a total, you know, kind of whiner about it. And Joe is just like, oh my God, if I could go to Harvard, I would go in a yeah. heartbeat. Yeah. And he's like, you're just wasting all yeah. your opportunities, you know, and yeah. Uh, yeah. and I think that kind of tension between them is also really interesting, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. The resentment there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, Alcott was a feminist. Her mother was a big reformer. That all makes sense. Like, she would have, she would have written that, you know, written into that. From the heart. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is kind of an interesting, then this is a, a, a kind of a good segue into the next question um, that we got from the audience. You said something about like getting to this in the story. Um, we got a couple of questions that are asking similar questions. So I'm going to, or a couple of people asking similar questions, I'm going to braid them together into one and say, how did you know um, as you were developing this story, because you could have gone in so many different directions, First, how many different like versions of this did you have to write, and how did you know when you had the right one? Like, was there like a? Was there, like, a <laughs> that's a great. That's like a great question. Like, how do any of us ever know? You know what I mean? I I know I had an outline that Margie kept uh, ignoring. <laughs> she'd be like, I, she'd be like, I don't know what to write. I'd be like, Have you looked at the outline? What about the outline? <laughs> Um, uh, wait, how long have you guys been friends? Can we just like, like, because uh, for those of us who don't know. We met in 2009? Right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, at that doing a panel with YA authors. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's true. And, and then with Katie Allender. Do you remember that? That was a YouTube show. I think mm -hmm. you've got like a decade of friendship under your belt. You met oh, in the of collaboration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So how did you know, like, how did you find that? Was it, I'm going to let you answer, you know, like, how did you, how did you get there? Well, I think, you know, we, I, I did feel like we would do well because we have um, always, you know, helped each other with, with each other's books, you know, with uh, breaking down plots, editing, um, you know, talking through things. And, but the difference is, you know, one is a Margie book and one is a Mel book. And if Margie's the, if it's a Margie book, Margie's a boss, you know, if her name's on it, she's the boss. If it, my name's on it, I'm the boss. So we kind of help each other in a, in a great way, but now we were both the boss. So that was hard because it was two, you know, it was two Joes writing the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we were going to burn each other's manuscripts. <laughs> you know, we would argue, and it's funny because Margie wrote the first half, then I wrote the second half, and then we toss it back and forth, and now we can't tell who wrote what. No. Um, and uh, but there were definitely certain things that, you know. I, I know that I wrote the garden bits and you wrote the feather bits. Like anything about finery, I know came from oh, you. Anything about plants, I know came from you. But that's almost the only distinction. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. And there would be, but I remember there would be certain things. Like we fought about, you know, like just sentences. It was so funny. It was like, and I don't even remember who won. Like, and we were rage texting each other, like with like exclamation points. And, um, and then there was, but there would be certain places where I would just be like, you know what, Margie feels really strongly about this, so I'm not gonna touch that part, you know? And so, and it was kind of a trust with another writer, you know, where I probably would have thought, I don't know if I would have done that or kept it in, but Margie seems to really care about this part, so I'm gonna, you know. And that's really interesting because mm -hmm. deep down, all writers have such big egos about like their one field of authority, which is their writing, right? Yeah. And so it's a really interesting thing. And mm -hmm. you should never write with anyone who you don't think is capable of being right when you're wrong. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, like I just knew there were some moments where if I, even if I didn't understand it, like it was wholly possible. It was in fact always wholly possible that she was right and I was wrong. Like that was just a fact, and I and you have to you have to respect the person that much going into it for mm -hmm. I don't know it yeah to trust to trust yeah. them I guess. Mm -hmm. and to have that humility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was there a moment for you guys when when it just felt like it had just come together in this really beautiful way, and like you knew that you'd done it, and it was beautiful? Was when there we were fighting, <laughs> it was one of those parts like. <laughs> Like, I remember specifically reading the Lady Harriet, there's like this sort of other person vying for Lori's attentions and specifically reading a bunch of decisions that you, Mel, made about that, that, that were surprising and that I couldn't have probably gotten to myself. Like, and I remember there are definitely like places where I like marveled at, at some, Things you did that surprised me, but I don't think it was like one moment where I was like, "Yes, we have achieved like the final test." It was more like along the way. Yeah, no. When when you when we did the sample and Margie wrote um, most of the sample, I was like, "Oh, we can do this." You know, that's when it was like I was like, it was so fun to get back into that world um, and everything that you said about all that stuff. I don't even remember. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember any of those things. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get to have like that pleasure of being a reader? Like, was there that yes. like, you get each other's pages? You know, you yeah, no, that was the, one of the best parts of it because it felt like we could read the book and work on it at the same time. Yeah, you know? and now I can read it and I enjoy it. You know, I don't know. I don't. Yeah. Read it. 
I mean, I remember that from Cammy because I wrote Beautiful Creatures with Cammy, and I remember that really clearly, like how much I missed uh, when I went to writing by myself, and there's like obviously great things about getting to do whatever you want and all these things, but how much I missed that like immediate feedback, right? Mm -hmm. And that like person who was like your perfect reader, your perfect, mm -hmm. perfect reader, because they, they were like in it with you and they like, Understood. Yeah. So that that's a really fun thing to have. Yeah. Gosh, that sounds amazing. Um, okay, we are going to take our last question. Um, we're gonna we're gonna begin wrapping it up. This is gonna be our final question. It's a great question. Um, somebody asks, how did you deal with the pressure of like? rewriting, re-envisioning a classic. That's really We talked about this a little bit, but like, I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I, 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 once again, I think I just, you know, I don't really think about it, you know? And I think it was like, oh my God, only we had a hubris <laughs> to do this, you know? <laughs> it's like, we're not just gonna retell Little Women, we're gonna be right in Little Women, you know? <laughs> I mean, usually people do, you know, the modern version, you know, the anime, the graphic novel version, you know, we, I mean, reading it is like reading another Little Women book, you know, and I thought that was so, fun and exciting. I, I don't know if I really thought, I think the pressure, if you think about the pressure, you can't do anything, right? It's paralyzing. Yeah. So I, I tend to ignore it. If, if I notice it, I just shut down. What about you, I Mark? I felt like we were, I felt like we were singularly equipped to do this. Cause Mel had been thinking about this idea for a long time and had, and had looked at a bunch of approaches and um, and I really honestly had had this whole like career when I was going to be a professor that I'd never done anything with. So like in a way, it was sort of the perfect storm. So we had a lot of confidence once we banked the sample that we knew we we knew we kind of had the chops in a weird mm -hmm. way. And we also yeah. knew that we were super nerdy, giant Alcott fans. And truly, just like wanted to do this, so yeah. like, we hope that people that it will get to a bunch of readers and that people will love it. But honestly, it really is one of these books that we wrote for each other and us and anyone who like threw that book against the wall and also loved it. Mm -hmm. Knows that I think. So I don't yeah. know that we ever had the, the the like nerve to do it, but we kind of like we just knew we were going to do it. Right? I think because we loved it. So we yeah. felt like we, you know, we maybe we're not just equipped, but that we wouldn't do, we would do it justice. Like we wouldn't, you know, I don't know. I didn't want to take anything away from it. I wanted to add, right? Yeah. Like we loved it so much. We wanted to spend time in it. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. I think, I think Mel also like you, you, I think you synthesized this whole thing and like in that, in that line, in that first bit of answering it when you were like, you know, if you're going to be afraid of a little pressure, then you're not going to do anything. So if you think it's worth doing and you love it, like, I'm just, I'm so pleased that you did. Thank you guys for taking that leap. It's an amazing book. If you have not read it. I hope you will buy a copy. Please support Romans for an amazing bookstore. If you're going to buy a copy of this book, buy it through Romans. Um, and uh, thank you guys so much for coming out. Mel, Margie, I love you guys. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all uh, for, for doing this. I, I felt like I was uh, just, I mean, I know that we were like in a conversation with friends and it felt like it because it was so great to be talking about this amazing book and at the same time feel like we're just having a good time with friends that I think uh, everybody kind of needs right now. Um, so it's, uh, it's it, it was really, it was really, really awesome. And um, if you would like to buy the book, yes, you can definitely go to the uh, buy Joe and Lori button down at the bottom of the screen. Um, and that will take you to the event page for tonight. And if you scroll, you can see the book book and um and to have his book there as well um so uh, you can purchase those um we encourage you to buy more than one um uh, we are uh romans is now uh open uh for curbside pickup uh and we are open in a limited amount uh in store uh very limited at this point um but you can go to our website and read more about it um, so um, also make sure to follow us here on Crowdcast, 
for getting notifications for future events. Uh, because even as we kind of get back into possibly, you know, some in-store shopping, uh, our events will stay virtual. Um, so uh, please make sure to follow us here and on social media. Once again, thank you all so much. Um, we really do thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. All right. Bye. All right. Good night, everybody. Don't forget to support all your independent bookstores. Have a great night. <laughs>